ko moha kate awa ko haruru te maunga ko ngati pa hauera te hapu ko ngati kahungunu te iwi tena koto tena koto tena koto kato which after that glorious introduction is actually really just a simple way of saying i'm just a simple bloke from a little place up on the north coast, uh, east coast of the north island called roponga now i was brought up in, up here in the 1950s in a totally non digital age in fact, in Rauponga, in this, the house I lived in Rauponga, had no electricity, no radio, well, a radio powered by a battery charge, 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 no lighting, and it was at the age of seven that electricity first arrived at this house. It was 55 years ago. I can still remember it like it was yesterday. I can also remember, this is my bedroom here, I can also remember that I had a beer bottle on this windowsill, and it said to Ian from John, Paul, George, and Ringo. That's the gate my father put it out in a bottle drive. <laughs> Tell you, it gets worse every year. <laughs> so we're going to jump through forward now to 1990 when um, we decided that we set up a company and we decided that we would turn, the future was going to be about digital data and our job was to turn digital data into pictures that people could understand. So we started with the America's Cup because nobody understood that. So t simply taking an X and Y coordinate from the back of one of those boats, this is what our team in Dunedin did, turning digital data into pictures that people could understand. So here we are tracking those boats at uh, five times a second. So this is this whole um, idea of taking digital data, turning it into data, and then the whole thing is about thinking about tomorrow. And this is taking you through a quick thing right through to 2009. Really thing here is that to create these images and to tell these stories better, we started creating cities to put them in their environment. Sport became a really, really big part of this, but you're going to be interested to see. The cool thing about sport was that the budgets were constrained, the time frames were absolutely strict. You cannot shift the opening day of the Olympics, so you had to find quick, clever and fast ways to develop software. So this is uh, from the Volvo Ocean Race. We developed tools, we had to develop tools that could build cities, that could track boats, that could do it all in real time and actually be fitted to a Dutch. This of course is the cricket. It's kind of really interesting because we're turning digital data here, 250 frames of data for each of those balls into cricket balls, then turning them into pictures. Around about 19, uh, 2000, I think, we bought TerraLink International, and we knew nothing about mapping, but we did know it was full of data that could be turned into pictures. So we started turning that data into the, golf, the sort of golf course thing, golf course that you saw there. We built 30 golf courses a year using that digital data. We track race cars. Again, it's all about turning digital data into pictures that people can understand. It also means you get to go to some really, really cool places. It includes tracking yachts and uh, sliders. And of course, there's always a little bit of controversy. A lot of people don't believe in the technology, including Sashon from Dilka. Still, he thinks it wouldn't have had. Uh, so, uh, because I've left my notes there, I'm not sure what the next slide is, so we'll just go straight to it. Ah. So, the digital data, the world of sports. So this is the Rugby World Cup. So for Sky, we just built Auckland so that they could use it for introductions to ever, each one of the matches, and so this is how they, they opened. Because this all rendered in real time, they could have countless um, versions of this digital data. So we'd gone from, so we'd gone from, well, he, this, is, this is the really sort of cool thing about it. Television had driven us into creating really accurate GIS digital data produced images in which to put this data to tell the story. It had to be done in real time so it could fit into picture, into television. But then we moved to the next step where having built that for the Rugby World Cup, we were approached by Auckland Waterfront who said, well, if you've already built that for the Rugby World Cup, could we add something else? Could we use it for planning and showing what the city might look like? Now, here we are flying from outer space. This is really interesting because I got a phone call 
on the night we were launching the Christchurch recovery video, which we'd spent the whole week, couple of weeks building. And they said, we have got somebody arriving here on Wednesday and we need to show them the new area down on the waterfront. So on Tuesday morning, the architects sent us these mo this model. By Wednesday, that was in the model, rendered and back to them on Wednesday night so that they could show it to the investors. And it's one of the things, and I know Rich is going to talk more about this tomorrow, but it's one of the really, really exciting things about what's happening in Christchurch. But I thought Carlos, um, just seeing what Carlos doing with data, if our business is turning digital data into pictures and seeing that superb and amazing data that's being, but that's being researched and built um, out of MIT, imagine what New Zealand, imagine what Christchurch could do if we start to take those technologies, put them into this, these engines. I really think the future, it is just so exciting. So again, this amazing stuff happening. We, you design it for something, you collaborate with someone else, someone else has a, an idea that, you know that thing you did there, I've got a better idea, why don't we use it over here? So you'd seen before, you know, we built all these cities for the cricket, the Ashes series. So we built Sydney, we built Melbourne, we built Perth. Well, we'd built Mel, um, Brisbane for the cricket and um, I get this phone call one day, I'm in, I'm in Auckland and I get a phone call and it's the news, present, news team in Channel 9 in Australia because they've just been hit with these huge floods. The guy says, look, Ian, could you, um, you know that model you built for the cricket? Could we flood that? Uh, look, I'm just about to get on a plane and I don't understand any of this technology anyway, so why don't, why don't I put you onto somebody else and you can talk when I land in Dunedin? So anyway, I hang up, I put them onto Ben Sharp and to see if they could sort that out. I fly to Dunedin, I get off the plane at Dunedin, the phone goes, and it's the um, editor for Channel 9 News. And he says, oh, hi, it's this and I think, oh, so were you able to work that out? You know, is there something we can do? He said, not only that, he said, we're uploading it now and it's on here in 15 minutes. So I want to show you, this model was built for the Ashes cricket game. We took the hydrological data from the flooding and put it into this for the news in the time it took to fly from Auckland to Dunedin. So... Normally, they'd fly down here and go around and up to the whatever the cricket field is and thing. But this was how the place flooded. This was how Brisbane flooded. And they compared these with the, the real pictures, and it was all matching up. It was totally, totally accidental. Imagine if we mapped these things properly so, um, and took the kind of data <laughs> that, that, that is available. So then we got to thinking, well, if... This is the case. What would have happened if they rang us last week and said, we want you to model this level, this level, this level, and that level, just to see what will happen when this stuff comes down so we can start getting ready. And that brought us to this idea that we would go into the world of recovery. There is an unprecedented opportunity Church in the heart of the South this Island of New Zealand. Opportunity on the edge of the sweeping Canterbury Plains lies the beautiful city of Christchurch. To see what can we do for the recovery. Now, I know Richard is really scared because I promised him I wasn't going to play that video. It will be continued as part of his address tomorrow. Um, but I, I was just really, really taken by because, you know, it, it, it was a, just an amazing... I know what it's like not to have your slideshow go, but the story was so strong. It didn't need slides. And it told us a lot about... What happens when things go down? What happens when we lose? When the digital world goes awry? We really, it's, and it's really interesting because somebody said, you know, um, there was a, a, a speech on TED, and I just can't remember who it was, but in this digital world we're in, this age of networking, old people like us, some of us, you know, we're immigrants to this world and we're learning the language. Young people like Becca are natives to this world and they speak it fluently. Um, I just want to finish, um, there was something else I was going to say, but it will come back to me because that's one of the other things about old age, you get Alzheimer's and you forget what you're going to say. <laughs> but I just think that, you know, visualising this data, the opportunity in Christchurch, but actually in New Zealand, to bring these resources together, to start taking that knowledge from overseas, and Carla, you are so right. I mean, we are working, we used to work in this tiny little space in our offices, at desks, head down, butts up. But today, this age, this network, 
that allows us to speak to the world, could allow us... I know we sneak in there and we look at MIT research and we steal research out of here, we steal it from Harvard and Stanford to put to here. So this kind of collaboration is really what the digital earth is about. And I think it's so cool when I think of those days sitting back there in a little house in Roponga with a battery-charged radio and a gas lamp listening to Life with Dexter with my dad. Thank you.